Welcome to Chapter 17. March 2020. Paddy's Palace and Transfer to Cork. I was staying more on a long-term basis in Paddy's Palace, a backpacker's hostel close to Dublin city centre. This was an improvement on my existing nomadic situation. I did have some difficulty lifting my luggage. I had problems with pain, fatigue and not being able to cope this coincided with the arrival of COVID. I was withdrawing cash at am ATM. It was at the intersection of Talbot Street and Lower Gardener, on a wall belonging to the cafe. It was around 8 p.m. The sky was dark, but neon lights were working. Talbot Street, which is full of cafes and shops was teeming with people. A cafe across the small road had plenty of guys outside, who were probably drinking coffee. A man waited behind me at the ATM. He was short and stout, and wore a hoodie. In the neon light, I could not judge the shade of his skin. The man smiled and said something. I commented the ATM was not working, but I would give it a try. He made me uncomfortable, but I was not sure why. When I got the money out, he grabbed me from behind and I could not get away. He assaulted me sexually with his hands with me screaming. Fortunately, I withdrew only 20 euros. Fortunately, as he was doing his thing, my money blew away in the wind. He dropped me to catch 20 euro note and ran off shouting you idiot, I just wanted your money. Another girl said she was beaten up at a city center ATM for her money and had to be admitted to hospital. I am sure this sort of thing happens in every city and country in the world. But I went to the nearby Garda station. They were not interested. I took the matter even further to the Garda ombudsman. This took a few months. I got a letter back from a female Garda ombudsman saying briefly the matter is not worth investigating. One chap is American, and he wanted to migrate to Ireland. He tried to leave after someone in his workplace pulled a knife on him for being queer. The Garda refused to take his complaint, and told him shut up or I will arrest you, he said. This hostel had to shut down for the pandemic. They sent me along with their long-term residents to their branch in Cork. This means due to COVID they give each person a separate room while charging dormitory rates because none of us could afford to pay for a private room. I liked it there. I liked Cork. But things were brewing in my mind. Remember I told you that I applied to stay in Ireland and this case was going on. That was the basis of my stay in Ireland. No they have a thing called the Dublin Regulation. This regulation had proposed to deport me to the UK in 2018. In 2019, this decision had been appealed. Later that year, it was lost. This meant I was to be deported by Ireland back to the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom then would take charge of my immigration case. At the time I left the UK, in April 2018, I was about to go to a further submissions court. I cancelled my appointment with them and went to Ireland instead. At the time I had left the UK, I was almost appeals exhausted with their immigration. But the exhaustion of the appeals itself was because there was no lawyer to take my case to a lower court of appeal, although such would have been possible and had me grounded. But the biggest factor preventing my success with UK immigration was the fact that lawyers did not want to help, despite their retention for a fat fee. Unlike Ireland, where I was always on legal aid, I never had legal aid in the UK. If one particular lawyer does not want to help and you go to another lawyer and things would get better. If no lawyer will help that is different from saying that they are not competent. 
Lawyers will, in general, be competent. If no lawyer will help me, this is not proof I am a bad person. Murderers get a huge amount of legal help from lawyers. If lawyers will not help me, there could be a political reason. Why they these lawyers don't want me in the UK? How about when somebody enters the UK you tell them you don't want them and they should go somewhere else? Would that not be better than eating 14 years of their life as they did to me? So this is an unproven hypothesis that the UK society has a political reason or racial hygiene reason why they don't want me. I just used the term racial hygiene. People would argue that I am talking nonsense because 50% of the UK population is from India and our current UK Prime Minister Mr Rishi Sunak. However, I feel that discrimination amounting to racial hygiene does not have to be based on race but on some other characteristic. Perhaps then, I should not call it racial hygiene. A different adjective should replace the word racial. But I am using racial hygiene because it is a term commonly understood. I don't for a moment believe that the Home Office, the judges and others have a problem with me or have a racial hygiene against me. I think something political on a lower level. Something to do with people, not with political parties. So regarding coming to Ireland, the Dublin regulation requires that people who enter one EU country after making an application in another EU country, the new country will send you back to the fold one. So if countries follow the Dublin regulation, people can only apply in one of them since the appeal of the Dublin regulation was lost. I was supposed to return to the UK. But a lawyer who was working for me on a charitable basis had said he would go to the High Court for me. Now this happens to be a lawyer who won hundreds, maybe even thousands of cases. He said he had a case in the Supreme Court and if that was successful he had 200 people for who he was appealing on the High Court and all 200 would be successful. And I happened to be one of the 200 now this lawyer was telling me that the IPO disapprove of me because I was moving all over the place and living in private hostels. I should live where the IPO asked. Me too. I have already explained the places were too dirty what with one manager trying to force me to take showers in a disgusting place. The lawyer made an application to help me to get back into their free accommodation. One was offered at Rosslair. I had some bad experiences and I was kind of having a breakdown over this issue. I had to travel to an unknown city or remote location. I told the lawyer I was scared that I would take all my bags and go to this remote seaside resort and then find that they don't want to open the door for me. If I left this cork hostel with my bags, they would not admit me back into the hostel. What I wanted was for the Rosslair hostel to confirm by phone that they would definitely have me. Since this hostel did not have a phone number, I felt unsafe to proceed. I envisaged a situation where I was stranded in the middle of miles of fields, outside a locked building, or with nothing but the sea in front of me, and bags too heavy for me to carry, along with my festering illness. In fact, in 2021, they did indeed put people who have arrived from afar to a remote location out of the front door at 4 a.m. due to enforcement. The lawyer said they are getting cross and you have to be there we can next 24 hours or you won't get it. Yes, indeed they give 24 hours notice and don't have a phone. You see with free things that's how it works. You know beggars can't be choosers. In October 2020 my lawyer won his Supreme Court case and 200 people he applied to the High Court forgot to stay with Ireland. That meant that the immigration case to stay would be decided by Ireland and not by the UK.